Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. Uh, question one is to Hugh Henry on infrastructure and investment in cities. Question one, Hugh Henry. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to invest in the road network in Renfrewshire South, including access to and from Glasgow Airport. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the completion of the M74 in 2011 has already made a significant improvement to journey times to Glasgow Airport, but we continue to invest in Renfrewshire's strategic roads through maintenance improvements, and they're also exploring how capacity of the M8 can be better managed using intelligent transport systems. In addition, we're investing £500 million to an infrastructure fund through the Glasgow and Clyde Valley City deal, which includes proposals to improve the road network around Glasgow Airport. Thank you so much, Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary's colleague, uh, Derek Mackay, will be well aware of some of the road issues in Renfrewshire, not just uh, in and out of Glasgow Airport. One of the important roads through my constituency is the A737. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the A737 is in need of investment and improvement, and will he commit to that? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we have a, a rolling programme of improvement for roads. I have mentioned the £500 million for the city deal, so there is also a role, in addition to the council's role, relevant council's role as roads authority, through the city deal to carry out improvements in their area. And of course, we also have, through the road maintenance agreement with local authorities, uh, the idea that we can work jointly with local authorities on programmes such as this. So uh, we have a programme of improvements to roads that's been set out now for a number of years. We, of course, look at any proposals that come forward or any requirement to invest in additional uh, roads infrastructure, and we'll do that in relation to the uh, 737. Thank you so much. John Mason. Uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary considers that the investment that's going on at the moment on the east end of Glasgow, the M73, the M8 and the M74, will also benefit traffic going right through to Renfrewshire and Glasgow Airport. Cabinet Secretary. That's a good question. I think everybody that uses that road uh, has seen the benefits over recent years. The M74, uh, from the M74, but also the additional works now taking place on the M74, the M73 and the M8 will also provide significant journey time savings and improve journey time reliability for businesses in central Scotland. And that, of course, also helps to support sustainable economic activity of existing and future businesses, including those in Renfrewshire, building further on the improvements uh, to the M77, the M80 and the M74, as I previously mentioned. Many thanks. Question two, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to encourage rail freight transport. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of the rail freight sector in moving vital goods and materials across the country and beyond in a safe and sustainable way. A transformative programme of investment, including a dedicated £30 million strategic rail freight investment fund, will support significant improvements in the capacity and capability of the railway infrastructure for freight services. But looking ahead, the Scottish Government expects to launch a public consultation to inform a refreshed rail freight strategy in the near future. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this Government's continued investment in rail freight is necessary to ensure that we continue to decarbonise our freight industry and build a greener economy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do agree. And I think the uh, track record that we have in terms of investment demonstrates that. Uh, rail freight produces around 76 per cent less CO2 than road freight. And each train can remove up to 76 heavy goods vehicles from the roads, also improving safety, efficiency and reducing congestion. But, of course, it's also true to say that we can't act on this alone. It requires a firm commitment from the rail freight industry and from industry more generally to work with us and also to invest uh, towards growth. Thanks. Question three has not been lodged in the name of Hanzala Malik. A satisfactory explanation has been given. Question four, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route project is on track for completion in winter 2017, which is earlier than originally programmed, uh, with construction well underway, and Crabstone and Dice Junctions expected to be opened by autumn 2016, followed, of course, by the Balmeri Tipperty section in spring 2017. 
Uh, thank, thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, and certainly the openings of the Crabston and Dice junctions will be very welcomed by businesses in the area. Um, the Queensferry crossing has obviously generated a huge degree of savings since its budget was first announced. Have any lessons been applied from the, the Queensferry crossing project to the Western Peripheral Route project? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, indeed. We take the opportunity to learn from all the major infrastructure projects. Perhaps the most critical one in relation to the AWPR was the uh, representations that we received and the concerns that we had about uh, utilities diverting or laying new utilities. And so a great deal of preparatory work was done on that, which of course can impact on the timescales. One of the reasons why we were able to bring forward uh, some of the elements of the project. We're also, in relation to the AWPR, taking on one of the largest communications exercises on any major roads construction project to date. And that includes as I'm sure the member is aware, meetings with the community councils, elected representatives, as well as the provision of a community liaison team and a contact and education space, very similar, as he mentions, in relation to the Queensferry Crossing. And that can be used, that space can be used as a learning resource by local schools and college, uh, colleges. We have also undertaken routine communications with communities and road users via e-zines, website updates, newsletters, flyers and public exhibitions. Thanks. Lewis MacDonald. The Secretary will be well aware of the ongoing discussions between uh, the Scottish Futures Trust and the Office for National Statistics around the funding model uh, used in the case of the AWPR. Is he able to give us any update on, on those discussions? Can he assure us that the local government partners in the scheme will not face additional revenue costs? And if, 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 but if indeed there is the prospect of additional revenue costs, will those be fully funded by the Scottish Government? Thanks, Alex. Um, I beg your pardon, Keith Brown. As the member mentions, there is discussion between uh, SFT, as he mentioned, and local authorities and others involved in uh, hub projects, and it's very important that uh, discussion takes place. Some of the projects uh, which had been programmed are not ready because the local authorities and others haven't reached financial close or ready to go to a financial close in relation to that. Uh, so it's important, I think, at this stage that the discussion keeps on going, and that's what's happening. SFT, I know, because I've seen it happen, are involved in those discussions. Uh, there is a continuing dialogue, as a member rightly says, in relation to the ONS and indeed with um, the Euro Eurostat agency as well to see how we can uh, resolve this. Um, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Deputy First Minister, reported to Parliament on the 9th of September and has undertaken to come back as soon as we get further information to update Parliament at that stage. But in the meantime, we will continue with that dialogue which the member mentions. Thank you. And now call Alex Sound. I could answer the questions if you wish, Deputy Providing Officer. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in terms of the interrelationship between AWPR and the AMSI Bridge on the A96, uh, could the Minister say a word about the benefits that that will achieve and the timescale? I mean, we've been waiting in the North East of Scotland 30 years through ineffective and useless Liberal Democratic representation to have the situation where the Scottish Government and my, my friend Dennis Robertson have achieved the Inveramsey Bridge Question coming is, to completion. Can he give us Question. an indication of the benefits of this major infrastructure improvement and its Many relationship thanks. to the AWP? Many thanks, Minister. I think the member is quite right to talk about the delay in relation to the Ember Ramsey Bridge. It's also worth bearing in mind that the AWPR itself has been campaigned for for the best part of 50 years, and it's taken this administration to bring that scheme uh, to fruition. But beyond the AWPR, BT, it's... The AWPR itself is the largest road scheme of its kind. The Inver Ramsey Bridge, though, uh, will bring huge benefits to Aberdeenshire through reduced congestion, improving journey time reliability by avoiding the existing bridge, as the member well knows, and enabling the free flow of traffic. Again, once again, this administration is the one that's delivered these real improvements for local people. Thanks. Alex Johnston. In recent weeks, I've had talks with members of the North Concarn Community Council and with landowners in the Stonehaven area regarding the liaison with, between the contractors and those who live along the route of the AWPR. Uh, given that the reports I've received uh, from these people are not as positive as the ones that the Minister laid out, will he undertake to look at the way that that liaison is conducted and ensure that we do live up to the high standards that have been achieved at the Queensferry Crossing? Cabinet Secretary. I'm not sure from the member's question whether he means the actual method of engagement has not been as positive as, uh, as some of the participants expected or there's been negative feedback coming back through it. Either way, I do undertake to look at this. I would say that 
In relation to the other communities affected, it seems to have been a very positive experience so far, and we did apply some of the lessons from the Queen's Ferry Crossing. So whether it's the case that there are some concerns which they feel are not being properly addressed through that process, or whether the process itself could be uh, changed to better adapt to local concerns, I'm more than willing to look at that, and I'll come back to the member on that issue. Yeah, thanks. Question five, Rhoda Grant. Scottish Government, what discussions it has had with the Scottish Futures Trust about the completion of the new Elgin High School? Secretary. Yeah, the Scottish Government engages regularly with the Scottish Futures Trust about a range of issues, including the delivery of Scotland schools for the Future Programme. Uh, the Scottish Futures Trust, on behalf of Scottish Ministers, are working closely with Murray Council and other project partners to ensure that all possible steps are taken to progress the delivery of Elgin High School. Many thanks, Rhoda Grant. I thank the, the Minister for that response. Can you tell us when decisions will be made and when we can expect the high school to be built? And like Lewis MacDonald, I would like to know if the Scottish Government are going to meet the additional costs of this delay. Well, I think my response to the latter part of the question is the same as it was to Lewis MacDonald. There is that discussion that's going on just now with uh, Murray Council. And, and the point I made to, to Lewis MacDonald was that, of course, had this proceeded at the time it was meant to proceed, had Murray Council been able to do that, that would have happened well before this school would have been built, or at least work started, well before we had the ESA 10 ruling. And the ESA 10 ruling is, which is, is the measure which has brought this uncertainty in relation to the programme. I do undertake, and I've said before, and the um, Deputy First Minister has said before, he will come back to Parliament as soon as he has hard and fast information. But it's our intention to make sure this school is built at the earliest possible opportunity. And thanks, Mayor Scanlon. I asked the Minister that, uh, given a recent report stated that every month's delay to building Elgin High School would add £100,000 to the costs, can he give a guarantee today that this additional cost, which is no fault of the local authority, does not fall on Murray Council taxpayers? Uh, well, all, no, I, all I can say is that the continuation of discussions between the SFT and individual partners in relation to that will continue, both in terms of costs and in terms of timescales. But just to point out that this delay which has occurred is, neither, is not all the, the fault of the Scottish Government either. Uh, the same is true for many uh, PPP projects which have been taken forward by other administrations. There are now serious concerns in the UK Government about the, ruling, the impact of this ruling on some of their programmes, and across Europe this has caused real concern. So this is not of the Scottish Government's doing. It's a change that came in in late 2014. But on the point about uh, costs and about the timescale for delivery, all we can do is make sure that we have the earliest possible resolution and continuing dialogue in the meantime between the SFT and the NISC case, Murray Council. Thank you. Jackie Bailey on Elgin High School. Um, the Minister, I think, will be aware that all projects from September 2014, including Elgin High School, have not reached financial close and therefore have been affected by ESA 10. Can he confirm that that case is correct? Uh, not all projects. Some projects uh, which um, would have been affected by this have been given the go-ahead, as the Deputy First Minister has previously reported uh, to Parliament. So some projects have gone ahead. Other projects uh, have not gone ahead. That is quite right. If, if they've not reached financial close, we obviously want to wait to resolve this, because to agree to these projects in the meantime introduces a level of risk which we're not wanting to see. So we'll continue to have those discussions, resolve the issue, and then move forward afterwards. Thanks. Question six, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what action it plans to improve public transport links in the West Scotland region. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. We are, as a Government, committed to improving transport links in the West of Scotland, and examples of that would include rail, where we have already provided enhanced passenger services, including four trains per hour between Ayr and Glasgow Central, uh, the 38 new Class 380 trains, providing 130 additional carriages through the Paisley Corridor improvements. Uh, the Scottish Government is also funding up to £40 million towards the fast link bus route and up to £246 million for the modernisation of the Glasgow subway. In addition to that, as I've mentioned, we're also investing half a billion pounds to a £1.13 billion infrastructure fund via the Glasgow and Clyde Valley City deal, which includes proposals to improve the public transport across the region. Thanks, Neil Webby. Recently, we've seen the completion of the Borders Rail Link, but now it's time for the SNP government to seriously invest in the West of Scotland Rail Network. The Glasgow Crossrail scheme would provide economic and transport benefits to Renfrewshire, as well as Inverclyde and Ayrshire, connecting these areas directly with central and eastern Scotland. This issue was raised with the Minister, Derek Mackay, at a recent cross-party group on rail meeting. Would Question. the Cabinet Secretary be willing to look again at the merits of Crossrail? And if not, can the Cabinet Secretary give clarity on why he and his government don't support Glasgow Crossrail? Cabinet Secretary. 
Yes, indeed, I've listened to the, those that are proposing this, the RailQuest Group and others who've uh, mentioned and promoted this scheme. We have looked at it in the past. In fact, previous administrations, I think, have also uh, looked at this in the past, and perhaps that's why previous administrations and, indeed, local councils haven't taken this forward. It does not, in our view, provide the benefits which justify the cost involved. That's our point of view. Of course, it's up to uh, local authorities if they wanted to uh, bring forward proposals uh, of their own in terms of infrastructure. Uh, they could do that, and we've said in relation, for example, to the city deal, which I mentioned earlier on, that we will try and make sure that both uh, Network Rail and ScotRail provide as much assistance in terms of information about the impact uh, of any rail improvements. But we don't believe the Crossrail project would provide the benefits that would justify the cost involved. Many thanks. Question 7, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that its infrastructure investment plan will help to deliver a low-carbon Scotland. Mr. Secretary. The Infrastructure Investment Plan 2011 Progress Report 2014, which was published on the 17th of March, highlighted various ways in which the plan is supporting delivery of a low-carbon Scotland. I thank, the, thank you. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Does he agree with the report from the Scotland's Way Ahead initiative, chaired by Sarah Tyam of the Institute of Chartered Engineers, that concludes that public sector investment in low-carbon infrastructure can deliver multiple benefits for Scotland? Secretary. I think it's worth mentioning, first of all, that our ability to meet climate change targets and challenges would be greatly enhanced if car manufacturers were to be honest about the cars that they are producing and the emissions which come from them. But I do agree with the member that our capital investments over the next decades will contribute to our emission reduction, energy efficiency and renewables targets, but they will also help encourage innovation, demonstrate best practice to support businesses and skills development and also be adaptable to future climate change. They should not lock in high carbon activity that means that meeting our climate change targets will be more expensive and disruptive, uh, disruptive in the future. Uh, our investments need to be fit for a low carbon Scotland. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Many thanks. Question eight, Dennis Robertson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government <coughs> what discussion it's had with the Scottish Future Trust on the development of the Afford Community Campus. Mm -hmm. Secretary Keith Brown. There is regular engagement between the Scottish Government and the SFT, as I've mentioned, about the schools programme uh, and construction of the new Afford Community Campus started in May 2014 and the project is due to be completed on programme in October 2015. Thank you. Dennis Robertson. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very positive answer. And I'm sure the families of Afford are absolutely delighted in this new development within Afford, uh, because it will bring together a community library and swimming pool as well. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that superfast broadband may also be going to the Afford community campus and to the wider Afford community? Say. I certainly would hope, as the member suggests, that uh, local communities will welcome the new campus. And I'm also happy to confirm that the Afford Community Campus is fully connected to broadband and has uh, Wi-Fi throughout. Uh, in relation to the wider community, of course, ongoing uh, programmes have been taken forward by the Deputy First Minister in relation to digital connectivity. Thanks. Question nine, Murdoch. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to minimise disruption to local residents and motorists during the A9 duelling. Absolutely. Uh, we recognise that the A9, of course, is vital to delivering sustainable economic growth in Scotland, and we're working closely with local authority partners to ensure that the A9 and local roads network continue to operate, and, of course, that local access is maintained in the meantime. Mr. Fraser. I thank the Minister for his response. The A9 duelling is uh, very uh, welcome. We've been waiting a long time for it to come along. But it is the experience of too many of my constituents that in the past repairs and Improvements to the A9 have been held at the busiest time of day, at the busiest time of the week and at the busiest time of the year. So given the importance of the A9 as a tourist route, how will Transport Scotland ensure that the upgrading works are scheduled as carefully as possible in order to minimise the disruption to local residents and to tourists? The member, of course, is quite right that we've been waiting a long time for the A9 duelling decades, I think, uh, Deputy President, also for that. And again, it's this administration which is actually taking that forward, uh, unlike previous administrations. The member is right to say, of course, there will be disruption. And he's also right to say that there can be frustration from people who are affected by that. But please be assured that Transport Scotland, the operating companies and the contractors in relation to the duelling works in particular are very experienced at this. And they do take into account when the heaviest traffic flows are likely to be there. They do try as best they can to minimise disruption. I think it's also worth saying that in addition to the duelling works, we do have some improvement works which are going on just now and a very particular um, incident as well, which is also causing some traffic disruption. But we do try 
and minimise this as far as possible. We are well aware of the extent to which communities right along the uh, line in the members' uh, constituency and right along the length of the A9 are affected by these works. But in the end, it is very important that we carry out this drilling, as the member has mentioned. We will do that with regard to trying to minimise any disruption as far as we can. Thanks. And that concludes that portfolio. And we now move to portfolio questions on culture, Europe and external affairs. I call on question one. Uh, Sarah Boyack, um, just give us a minute. Uh, Ms Boyack, and uh, once the Cabinet Secretary is ready. Right. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions regarding new cultural investment it has had with the City of Edinburgh Council. Secretary. Uh, I met with councillors and officials of the City of Edinburgh Council on the 5th of August 2015 to discuss the Council's vision and strategic priorities around capital, uh, cultural capital spending projects. Uh, Scottish Government officials had a follow-up meeting with the Chief Executive and Executive Director of Culture, Cities, Strategy and Economy on the 11th of August. Can I welcome that engagement and ask the Minister if she supports the St Mary's Music School proposal for a centre of excellence in the Old Royal High School, a win-win for culture, and will she now support the development of a tourism levy so that the Council can invest in historic buildings and arts venues the city needs if it is to retain its status as a global centre of cultural excellence, given the 8.5% reduction in funding for local government noted by Audit Scotland this year? That uh, I understand that to be part of the proposals that have been put forward for a potential Edinburgh City deal that's been put forward um, by the Council. That obviously is subject for discussion with uh, Cabinet colleagues across, um, uh, across government. Uh, certainly there is some strong resistance, as you'll be aware, to a tourism levy. Uh, but I do think it's important that we address the cultural uh, engine that is Edinburgh and how we can drive uh, for that uh, uh, agenda. On the first point, I hope she appreciates that uh, with my responsibilities as Minister with the responsibility for Historic Scotland and indeed some of the issues around listed buildings, it is not possible or indeed ap uh, appropriate for me to comment on the first part of her question. Thanks. Question two, Alison McInnes. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed the refugee crisis with the UK Government. Minister Humza Yusuf. The First Minister and I met Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond on the 21st of September, welcoming the UK Government's recent decision to take refugees, making the case that the UK, of course, must go further than it has and set out a clear timetable to meet its commitments. On the 21st of September, I also met with the UK Government's newly appointed Minister for Refugees, uh, Richard Harrington, with responsibility uh, specifically for Syrian refugees, to discuss in detail some of the practical actions that we can take forward and that are necessary to coordinate the arrival of refugees. Furthermore, representatives of the UK Home Office uh, attend the Refugee Task Force, which last met on Wednesday, the 23rd of September, uh, and indeed uh, the most recent weekly conference, teleconference between the Home Office uh, officials, local government officials, and the Scottish Government uh, took place last Friday, the 25th of September. Thanks, Thank the Minister for that reply. I share the Minister's view that the UK should take more refugees than is currently planned. Has the Scottish Government carried out an assessment of local council's capacity to accommodate refugees, and does he believe that the capacity is there for us to take more than Scotland's so-called fair share of what we both agree is a pitifully small number for the UK as a whole? And if so, has he told the UK Government that our Government is willing to provide for more than a fair share in order to boost the overall UK number? Minister. I thank the member and note and put on record her own uh, interest in this subject over a number of years in terms of refugees uh, and those seeking asylum uh, in this country. What I would say to her is I've never in the three years that I've been in government seen uh, such a uh, really effort for local authorities, Scottish government and the UK government, particularly the Home Office, to work seamlessly together to ensure we're all coordinating our efforts uh, across this important issue. So I would say that's very positive. I would say the response from local authorities to the member has been overwhelming. Uh, in terms of the detail of how much capacity there is per local authority area, what I would say is I know that COSLA are, are collating that information. It would be wrong of me uh, to breach any of the confidences that COSLA have shared with me, uh, but I am very confident that if refugees were to arrive tomorrow, then we would be in a good place to be able to provide them with not just suitable accommodation, but the appropriate services that wrap uh, around them uh, as well. But I am happy to keep the member uh, up to date. In terms of increasing our own number, it should be said that when we talk about that fair share, that 10 per cent roughly of the UK number, if we are able to do more, then of course uh, this Scottish Government has never been found wanting uh, when it has come to its, its response to refugees. Thanks. Clear Baker.
Thank you. Um, while the UK Government have committed to 20,000 refugees over five years, the Minister will know there has been calls for a front-loading of the number um, of refugees. Has the Minister discussed this with the UK Government, if there is a possibility of Scotland front-loading the number of refugees we are looking to support? Minister. I think it is an important point that the Member raises. She will know that uh, there is no disagreement uh, from the Scottish Government in terms of her proposal. I did discuss it uh, with the Minister for Refugees and I have to say he's actively considered, uh, considering that and the Home Office are thinking of that. I, I don't think I would be breaching any confidences at all to say that they understand that this won't be a, a 4,000 per year or a 5,000 per year uh, job at all. They're thinking of how they can immediately help and uh, you know, any assistance that Scotland can provide, whether it's taking people immediately, uh, then that is something again that we would be happy to consider. Next question three, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update in its response to the refugee crisis. Mr. Uh, thank the Member for the question. The First Minister convened a refugee summit earlier this month, bringing together a wide number of stakeholders. That summit, she announced a task force would be set up, uh, of which I chair. This task force has now met three times and has established two subgroups, one looking at refugee accommodation, the other one looking at refugee integration which both met for the first time last Tuesday. Uh, as the Scottish Government, we've made uh, available an initial £1 million to ensure that services across Scotland are prepared to deal with the arrival of refugees. The response from local authorities has been very positive, uh, and we're ready to assist refugees as soon as they arrive. Yeah, thanks, Willie Coffey. Yeah, thank the Minister for that answer. Could he possibly further update us on any particular numbers agreed by local authorities, and whether any additional central support has been requested to assist with things like language difficulties that might arise? Minister. I think the member's point is a very important one. COSLA, as I mentioned in, in a previous answer, they are collating that information. Of course, we have to give them the appropriate time to do that. Uh, the Refugee Emergency Summit was only convened just over uh, three weeks ago, so we're moving at a heck of a pace. But the point that the member makes is very important. Of course, local, local authorities uh, will have to think about the financial uh, pressures that they're, that they're perhaps already under, but also the financial pressures of taking in refugees. And what I would say is the discussion between the Home Office, local authorities, of which the Scottish Government is also involved, I have to say the tone of that has been very positive and very constructive from all sides. Uh, and there will be certain gaps in service provision with particular local authorities. Glasgow clearly has a lot of expertise, has the integration services there, but that's not the same for local authorities across Scotland. And where those gaps do exist, the Scottish Government, the Home Office and the local authorities will work together to plug those gaps. Alex Johnson. Since we last experienced our comparable refugee crisis, there has been a significant change in the structure of public housing in Scotland. Will the Minister undertake to ensure that uh, when the decisions are made about where these uh, refugees will be housed, that we will avoid the two key errors, firstly of housing too many all in the same place? Uh, and secondly, that we can avoid the situation where local authorities uh, are forced to provide housing uh, in pressurised areas where there are already people who have been in the waiting list for a long time and may be alienated by this process. I thank the member for raising what I think are a couple of important points. It is important to recognise that, of course, when refugees arrive here, they will have the same rights as anybody else in terms of the homelessness legislation that we have uh, in this country. Uh, the uh, points that he makes, I think, are well understood by the task force that I convened, that we don't want to, uh, in effect, uh, create uh, ghettoisation. We know that that is not conducive to not the refugees themselves, but, of course, the communities in which they end up being housed. So we're very aware of that. So the, we would like to see refugees dispersed across a wider area. And I've been very overwhelmed by local authorities from across Scotland offering to take in uh, their share of refugees. And in terms of the communities themselves, there's an understanding that they will ha we will have to work closely with the communities before refugees even arrive to make sure that there's community buy-in. Uh, and so I think the points about housing and housing pressures are well made, and it's something that the Refugee Task Force is very conscious of. OK, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Uh, is the Minister uh, open to considering accommodation that's, uh, that's not uh, local authority accommodation or even social rented accommodation to be considered in the, uh, going forward with the situation? Minister. There's been plenty of offers uh, of accommodation, and I would say our preference as a government would be to work with local authorities to what is the most suitable. Uh, and, and at the moment, the, if we can manage it within existing social housing stock, then that will be 
the preference for not just the government but also all the partners involved in the Ministerial Task Force. There have been some very get generous and very kind offers uh, that have come in. So where those offers, I think at the moment we're at the stage of exploring and collating as much information as possible. So I would say to the member, if there are particular offers uh, that have come in to him, uh, please do forward them on to us. And as I say, we keep an open mind uh, on all of these issues. Many thanks. Question four, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how Scotland's traditional arts are funded. Uh, President Jackson. Officer, the Scottish Government supports traditional arts through a number of its public bodies. Creative Scotland has, for example, awarded 1.4 million to 156 applicant organisations and individuals since it's opened its project funding in October last year, with a success rate of 37%, sign significantly higher than other art forms. In addition to the £7 million over 2015-18 to its regularly funded organisations working on traditional arts, Creative Scotland has published a full list of their support for traditional arts on their website on the 15th of September. There is Scottish Government funding over the traditional arts from Borna Gaelic, our Youth Music Initiative, the Festival's Expo Fund and BBC Alpa. In addition, Radio Nangale has given significant exposure to traditional music and contributed to its funding. Thanks, Rob Gibson. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I think generally the Scottish traditional music uh, uh, sector sees big improvements uh, to their status during the time of the Scottish Government since 2007. But the Scottish Government's Traditional Arts uh, Working Party also agreed that uh, an equivalent to national companies should be explored for the traditional arts. So in order to give parity of esteem, is that proposal being taken forward? Um, I thank the member for his uh, question. I think it's an important area, uh, particularly in relation to that parity of esteem, and that's something we've worked very, very hard of, over uh, the period of this government to achieve. Um, I think the concept of uh, how you work uh, in terms of a national company perhaps may not be suited to work in the traditional arts, but I am interested in his proposals and will ask officials to look further into that, uh, into that aspect. He's right to refer to it as being a, a one of the proposals from the Traditional Arts Working Group, um, and it's, uh, although many of the other aspects of that Working Group recommendations have been taken forward, this is one that uh, to date has not. Thanks, Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. In evidence to the Education Committee, the Traditional Music and Song Association for Scotland said they were having very serious difficulties accessing funding, um, in other words, they were unsuccessful, to support young musicians to develop their career, as well as bringing their music to diverse communities in Scotland. They were only asking for under 15,000. Why didn't they get it? Uh, the member will be aware that uh, ministers themselves would not consider uh, individual applications of that level for funds that are administered by Creative Scotland. And indeed, she may be familiar not only with the fantastic work of, Fe uh, of Fesh Ross in delivering the Youth Music Initiative, but I visited uh, Inverness Leiden Court, which is now one of the new youth arts hubs that have been set up as part of our youth arts strategy. And again, fantastic traditional music taking place um, led from there. I am aware that Mary Scanlon raised support for traditional arts in the Education and Culture Committee on the 15th of September and the Scotsman published an article quoting her that was subsequently withdrawn along with an apology from the editor to the Chief Executive of Creative Scotland about its contents and the accuracy of the full picture. Many thanks. Question five, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government whether the v &E project in Dundee will be audited by Audit Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. A uh, decision on whether to audit any aspect of the v uh, Dundee project would entirely be a matter for Audit Scotland. The Scottish Ministers have no role in such a decision. Yeah, thanks. Jenny Mara. I hope, the, uh, I hope that Audit Scotland uh, may take this consideration very seriously then and the Cabinet Secretary may do uh, all she can to perhaps encourage that in whichever way is appropriate because she will know as well as I do that there are concerns about spiralling costs of this project and there are also concerns about governance. The V&A project fits exactly into Audit Scotland's definition of an ALIO and Audit Scotland also requires... I will. Alios to consider governance at the outset, to scrutinise performance and accountability and to monitor cost performance and risks of these alios. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the V&A project is indeed an alio of Dundee City Council? Cameron. Well, in relation to her question, I think in terms of governance, the McClellan report, which was produced, identified a number of areas, uh, particularly in looking back at the original budget costs, which you referred to. And obviously, clearly, the underestimates within the original budget was one of the, the key aspects of the increase 
in the overall budget cost. In terms of the reporting, uh, corporate governance arrangements, the report also, McClellan report, concludes that more frequent direct reporting on the V&A to members would have been helpful. And following adoption, the Council has uh, taken forward the project board uh, since 2015 in order to make sure that there's more um, openness and transparency. Uh, I'm sure the Council will listen to the points made by Jenny Mara, but she must always, always, when she comes to this chamber, remember to champion the V&A as a great project for Dundee. Absolutely. This side of the House seems to do it. She seems incapable of promoting the V&A. Excellent. Christian Allard. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary maybe outline what benefits she believes the V&A will bring to Dundee, to the North East, and more generally to Scotland? The Secretary. Well, it's great to hear one of the North East MSPs promoting the v and um, It will act as a, a magnet for Dundee's re regeneration. It will help inward investment and promote tourism growth. Uh, it will be, they will have public access to understanding uh, the extent of design collections, both from the v and and from across Scotland's design uh, heritage. But also importantly, fundamental to its mission will be the fostering of creative design thinking amongst businesses to improve innovation, profitability and opportunity. Very important to the the economy of Dundee, but also of all Scotland. Thanks. Question six, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason it provided financial assistance to Tea in the Park 2015. Uh, Tea in the Park is one of the most popular and successful cultural events in Scotland's annual events programme. It delivers significant economic impact, drives additional tourism and supports jobs. In 2014, the event generated £15.4 million for the Scottish economy. The event faced unanticipated costs and reduced returns, and the funding was to support a successful transition to the Strathallan site and support the format at that site in 2016 and 17. There is a clawback provision should the event not take place in Strathallan in 2016 and 17, and the detail and timeline of events that led to the one-off grant payment being made is contained within my answer to parliamentary question S4W26910, uh, dated the 14th of August, and in my evidence to the Education and Culture Committee yesterday. Many thanks. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I think after yesterday's appearance at the committee, there are more questions than answers. And can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if she will agree to come before Parliament and provide a, a full statement and be open to question to the full Chamber? Can I also ask her to confirm that Tea in the Park made a profit and as such explain why £150,000 of taxpayers' money was used to support uh, a venture that was making profit and also a company that made multi-million pounds of profits? Mm -hmm. Secretary. Uh, the member may not be aware, and clearly from his question, um, he's not, that I did provide um, answers during an extensive session with the committee yesterday. And he's correct in identifying that the overall company is a profitable company, but those companies will judge events event by event. And if they do not see that that event because of uh, an unanticipated extra costs or indeed leading to, uh, and leading to reduced revenues uh, means that they may want to change the setup, that might mean that Glasgow may benefit from more individual single stage, uh, single day uh, concerts uh, run by that company, uh, but I don't think that would be the tea in the park that many, many people across Scotland have grown to love and many, many people appreciate. And as I mentioned earlier, the economic impact of £15.4 million, pounds, not just the Scotland's economy, but also the impact for the local economy. We want to make sure that festivals um, are celebrated and enjoyed across Scotland, not just in our cities. No. Many thanks. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. In relation to the uh, timeline associated with the financial assistance that the Cabinet Secretary provided to the Education and Culture Committee yesterday, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether ministers or their officials had any meetings or were engaged in any communication with DF concerts beyond the completion of Tea in the Park Festival on the 12th of July? Cabinet Secretary. Um, in relation to the point about officials, I would need to check and come back to the member on that point. However, uh, she will be aware that some of the major issues that I think she raised herself were, was about the transportation issues, it was about some of the exit um, issues at the event itself. So I'd, I'd expect, particularly in relation to the transport aspects, that there would have been some uh, communication and contact. In relation to um, the post the event, we expect to get the uh, reports that we have required as part of the grant conditions, and that will come to ministers at the appropriate time. Governor MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that DF Concerts hosted a series of concerts, the summer sessions in Glasgow this year. 
Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of any funding from the public sector for those concerts and who provided it? The, uh, the Scottish Government did not provide uh, DF concerts and events with financial support for the summer sessions in Glasgow. Uh, we understand, however, that £200,000 from Glasgow City Council to provide delivery of the summer sessions was provided. Um, it was funded on a commercial arrangement uh, to establish the summer sessions on a level commercial footing so that in future years they would generate money for the city. Okay, thanks. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, after reflecting on the exchanges yesterday, can she confirm whether she asked her officials to establish uh, what, if any, additional contribution had been asked by DF uh, events from the lead sponsor tenants to cover the cost of the additional transition costs? Cabinet Secretary. In, in terms of official scrutiny, uh, there were extensive scrutiny from officials and indeed the state aid uh, unit within the Scottish Government, and part of that was looking at the revenue and indeed the projected budget that was coming forward from DF concerts. Yes, um, people would like to see the content of that, but commercial confidentiality clearly has restricted that. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions for today. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14405 in the